Welcome, everyone. My name is Kate Schoen, and I'm Vice President of Communications and Community Engagement for Caring Americas. Caring is a luxury group of luxury houses with a strong commitment to gender equity, and we're sponsoring tonight's discussion as part of our Women in Motion initiative. Women in Motion is a program that shines a light on the talents and achievements of women in arts and culture. In honor of this special event and to thank our gracious hosts at the Dallas Museum of Art, we've partnered with Fiden and its sister company, Artspace, to debut a new limited edition print by Jennifer Guidi, a Los Angeles-based painter and one of tonight's panelists, whose work is included in Fiden's acclaimed book, Great Women Painters. Proceeds from the sale will support the DMA in its mission to keep equity at its core, including its commitment to showcase women artists. Rainbow Orb 2, which you see right here, is based on an original painting with the same name and is finished with screen printed varnishes and fine glass beads to echo the textures that characterize Guidi's work. Each of the only 35 limited edition prints are framed according to the artist's specifications to highlight and protect the print's delicate surface details. If you're interested in purchasing the print to benefit the DMA, please see me after the discussion. Caring's Women in Motion initiative launched in 2015 during the Cannes Film Festival to raise one question. Why don't women have equal power in the film industry? I couldn't help but notice the similarity between this and another provocative question. Why have there been no great women artists? which was posed by the legendary art historian, Linda Nochlin. It became the title of what would immediately become the seminal essay in feminist art criticism, and later the inspiration for Fiden's book, Great Women Artists, and now Great Women Painters. When it was published by Art News in 1971, the essay included the subtitle, Implications of the Women's Lib Movement for Art History and for the Contemporary Art Scene, or Silly Questions Deserve Long Answers. <laughs> In a sense, Great Women Painters is a continuation of that very long answer to a silly question that Nochlin posed as it seeks to further set the record straight. So much has changed for women in the arts in the last five decades, and yet Notkin's essay remains, remains all too relevant. In it, she explores the constructs, assumptions, and systemic inequalities that define our culture's perception of great with a capital G, art with a capital A. Nochlin argues that great art is determined less by personal genius and more by education and other forms of institutional support, including, quote, art academies, systems of patronage, mythologies of the divine creator, artist as he-man, or social outcast. As Mary Beard asked in 2017's Women and Power, a manifesto, we have to be more reflective about what power is, what it is for, and how it is measured. To put it another way, if women are not perceived to be fully within the structures of power, surely is it not power that we need to redefine rather than women, unquote. 
Perhaps it is the responsibility of people who love art to continue asking the right questions. Fearlessly, intelligently, passionately, and yes, provocatively. Because change always begins with the question, what needs to change? But it is the follow-up question, what can I do to change the thing that delivers real progress? The painters who are with us here tonight embody the progress and the promise of much more exciting progress to come. To introduce them, it's my great pleasure to call to the stage tonight's moderator to get the conversation started. Please join me in welcoming the Hoffman Family Senior Curator of Contemporary Art at the Dallas Museum of Art, Dr. Katherine Broadback. so much, Kate, for that extremely compelling introduction. Thank you so much to everyone for being here. And I am honored to introduce our very distinguished panelists in the order that they appear on the stage. Lisa Yeskavage, Shabala Self, Genesis Tremaine, and Jennifer Guidi. I know I speak on behalf of everyone in this packed house tonight that we are especially gracious for you, grateful for you. Um, for being with us tonight. So for a bit of housekeeping, I'm going to ask a couple questions of each artist and then about 10 minutes till the stop time, we will open it up to the audience. It is always such an honor to be surrounded by great painters, but it's really a particular pleasure to be surrounded by great women who are also great painters. Your practices are quite diverse, coming from different generations and backgrounds, with practices ranging from abstraction to figuration, reveling in the sumptuousness of paint, or extending the medium to incorporate a great variety of textural elements. And I am particularly excited to delve into your respective histories in the medium of painting, which is exactly where we'll start. So painting has been a very exalted medium, but also critiqued repeatedly over the years and yet you are all deeply committed to painting. How did you come to painting and what keeps you invested in it? Lisa, let's start with you. <laughs> um, how I came to painting. So uh, the uh, way that I came to painting was I think really that I went to a high school which was a magnet school for girls in Philadelphia called the Philadelphia High School for Girls. Um, it wasn't particularly focused on art, but I ended up being able to be selected as a, uh, in a group of kids that was considered, um, you get, picked out of that group, um, and you were taken to even more exceptional um, events, like we were taken to the Philharmonic, the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra, and also given opportunities to be taken on guided tours of the Philadelphia Art Museum by incredible art historians. Um, recently, I actually um, came across a letter because I'm doing a big archiving project in my studio that's been going on for about 15 years. Um, and I found a letter from the Philadelphia Art Museum recommending me in a career in the arts from an art historian. It said that I had a good grasp on art concepts. And um, I think that it was during that tour of the Philadelphia Art Museum, I remember standing, I come from a very humble background. My parents never held me back um, in terms of, I, I come from an immigrant background. 
and my father was a, um, my mother says, say it right, he was a driver salesman, he sold pies, and um, before that he sold milk, and, um, but I never felt poor. Um, I always had anything I wanted, and we always had a great education. I went to Yale. My education was entirely paid for. They saved money. Um, so they were very intelligent people, but they always said, do whatever you want, just, you know, be happy. So I was very lucky that way. So when I went to the Philadelphia Art Museum and I stood in front of, in particular, remembering a Vincent van Gogh painting, uh, Madame Rouault holding her baby, I said, that's what I want to do with my life. It was an extraordinary painting, uh, incredible green, um, this color green that was so emotional. Um, there was something about that painting that just changed my idea about what life could be, what you, uh, I didn't, I never even knew anything about art. I just decided I wanted a piece of whatever that was and just figured out how to get there. And then, was there a second part of the question? <laughs> <laughs> so you took us up to the very, from the very beginnings of your encounters. What keeps you invested in painting? It's incredibly fun and engaging. Um, I suppose I have a very active brain and if you truly know how to paint and how to do painting in a way that is um, not boring, there's a way to make paintings boring for yourself and then there's a way to make paintings really interesting for yourself um, to uh, open them up endlessly to make um, exciting choices to endlessly open up paintings uh, Play, play it out in a way that's extraordinary for yourself to endlessly raise the bar and ask yourself more and more questions and to engage in history. Um, it's never boring and you're constantly falling both forward and backwards in space. And the world of art history, I mean, I find myself walking around the museum today and you know, these painters, who are dead, they may not like me, but I don't care, I love them. <laughs> they're like my friends. I'm glad they're dead, because it's like I can just have this seance with them and sort of talk to them, and you know, it's like in their death, they're my friends. You know, it's like they might have been sexist assholes when they were alive, but I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying, the, I enjoy the conversation I can have with them now. Um, the painting that we have here is, is actually kind of a funny, um, I chose this one because it's, I think that the size is actually, I, I can't read what it says there, and I was told very specifically not to turn around. But um, <laughs> it, I, it's, it's 12 feet by, I think 10, 10 or 12 feet by eight, eight or nine feet. It's, it's a big painting. Um, and it's the uh, night classes of the Department of Painting, Drawing, and Sculpture. So uh, a few years ago, I started to actually reimagine going back to a classroom and imagine them as theaters or sort of um, stages where my own education as an artist began and sort of like these kind of kinky scenes that would go on in the middle of the night, which kind of did happen. Um, <laughs> and you know, you get bored trying to figure out how to paint abstract paintings and they just start messing around. And it's, it sort of like became this kind of fun um, way of putting a painting together in the sense, um, paintings are emotional, formal, um, historical, time travel. You're speaking to the past, the future, your internal life. You're speaking to the future. You're speaking to people you've never known. You're speaking to people that you will know. I have met my husband. I've met my best friends. I've met you know, people that I still don't know. I've met all kinds of people that um, I would never know if it wasn't for the fact that I made paintings. It's an exciting life. That's the best thing I can say about it. So, you know, become a painter. And one other thing I was gonna say, <laughs> I mean, who would know that becoming a painter is something that is such an extraordinary thing? Thing about, I t used to teach a lot, and I used to teach mostly because I needed the money. I didn't teach because I wanted to teach. I taught because I was broke. 
and I taught at Princeton <clears throat> at one point, and one of the things about teaching at Princeton was, um, and I taught there because they paid a lot, and um, <laughs> I'm being honest, the, the kids at Princeton, they didn't want to be artists. That was pretty clear. Um, but I loved teaching them because they were so bright. And I gave them a book to read, and it was painting as a pastime. Um, and, 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 and it was um, a, a, oh my god, I'm like spacing it out. Not, not I've gone this far. Um, it, was, it was written by, um, oh my god, just like um, Churchill, Winston Churchill. Sorry, I, I had total brain fart there. Winston Churchill, thank you, somebody else knew the book. Winston Churchill's Painting as a Pastime. And it was, it's a really extraordinary little book. And I read it first before I gave it to them, obviously. And Churchill really understood the e extreme complexities of painting. And obviously he was a big guy and he didn't know, like on his breaks between wars and what, whatever he was doing, <laughs> he didn't want to like relax by playing tennis or you know, hiking, and he needed to take a break mentally. And he talks in the book very, very beautifully about how when you fully, fully engage in painting in a really complex way, it is like a total, your brain completely goes to another place. So I gave these kids this book, and so many of them really, really got it and appreciated it, and I'm sure they've gone on to become, you know, people in Washington, and I could only hope that they just you know, are good-natured people that vote for the arts. Anyway, that's my, that's my 10 four. Thank you, Lisa. I think that is such a wonderful expression of, although painting seems to be, you know, the most weighted by history of all the media, that it still has so much possibility that we see in each of your work to kind of reinvent, you know, these worlds, even in dialogue with this very, you know, kind of weighted tradition. Um, Shaba, how about you? Um, well, it's kind of hard to follow Lisa, I think. <laughs> but, um, I've always painted, and even as like a child, so I would say I did that mostly in lieu of playing, and it was always a way for me to, I guess, kind of decompress, and I don't know, I guess, like maintain my own memories. So when I was younger, um, I got a lot of opportunities to pursue the arts, and I did. I went to Harlem School of the Arts, which is like an after-school program in my neighborhood. It was actually right around the corner from where I lived, and I had a pretty creative household. Like my father, both both my parents, they moved from New Orleans, so my dad can pursue his MFA, and there's always lots of art in my home. And me being the youngest of five children, my siblings all growing up in New York, they had a lot of friends who were creative, so I felt like I always had access to different kinds of creative outlets, and I saw a lot of, um, I guess, models of how like, adults who were creative people. Also, New York, and especially Harlem in the 90s, was such a vibrant area that I felt like it was just people were just creative in almost everything that they did, the way they dressed, the way they spoke, the way they interacted with one another. So painting, I would say, was just a, um, was a way in which I expressed my own creativity. Um, and that was the, way, the medium that was the one I had the most affinity with. And there have been periods in my, um, my life or my creative journey where I didn't focus on painting. In college, I mostly focused on printmaking. And now, at this point in my artistic career, I'm, I still see myself as a painter. I, I always think about each different genre of art or even each different medium. I still think about it as a painter because I feel like there's a certain philosophy to painting. Um, mainly the philosophy being that when you put one thing next to the other, the former changes. So kind of, like, kind of something you mentioned earlier too, Lisa, is that painting is really a relationship, it's really a philosophy about relationships and it's rooted in the idea of color theory. And you can really apply, you can really apply that philosophy to anything, to any kind of medium. And I think that's the reason why all artists had at some point, or most experiment with painting, and that's why I see painting as being like foundational. Um, 
even more so than drawing, even though I think drawing is the most intuitive medium people would think as being kind of a foundation for artistic career or arts education, I feel like painting more so than that. And I think something about paintings being two-dimensional and them interacting with the wall, because they, don't, they do not occupy the same dimension that we do, and because they have a different kind of physicality because of their flatness, you can literally project into them. So it's more appropriate for world building. So for all of those reasons, I find painting very exciting. And it's something, it's, for all those reasons, that's why I enjoy painting, even if I do take some departures or experiments working in different modalities. Lovely. And I think um, your work really points to two. I mean, we're looking at these wonderful examples that, you know, also include textiles and different elements that painting can be kind of expansive and thinking through these different modalities together and kind of how it absorbs so much. Genesis, how about you? Would you mind reading the question one Absolutely. more time, dear? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so it's really just about how you came to painting and what sure. keeps you invested in painting, given kind of the, the strong history of the medium. Sure. Uh, good evening. Um, painting, or well, paint, is something that I had to earn. Um, there were always number two pencils around the house. And I had an uncle who was in construction, so he always had a big box. And his box had cool markers and like tape and paint. I had to behave and get really good grades in order to spend time painting. Uh, and I had to earn my paint. I paint with both putty and I also paint with paint. When I was younger, my grandmother taught me to mix pigment um, because paint is very expensive. So. Um, it's something that I was awarded for having good grades. I was for my birthday, for Christmas, and I cherished those spaces. They hung in very special areas in my room. Um, it was, it is my private place, if you would. Um, and painting is also um, something that I know I'm good at, like I'm great at it. Right? Beautiful. So when you're young and you, you, you know you're good at something because uh, adults will adorn you by putting it up, right? So I knew that if I, if I drew something, my mom would put it up. But if I added color, Nana would put it up. <laughs> and if I added paint, my dad would frame it. So it was, it was a way that I drew attention to myself. And um, when I was a child, I would do anything to bring that sense of light or attention to myself. Um, paint is as fluid as I am. And painting is also very challenging. Uh, it keeps my brain occupied. I appreciate what you said about that. Um, I'm not bored with it yet. And I'm still growing in it. I'm still praying through it. I get to swim in it. I like the way it feels in my hands. Um, I like the way it makes me feel. And I really like um, what God, like the way God uses me to, to move it. Um, it has become my own movement. Um, I am able to exist in testimony in paint. Um, so painting has become a need. It's an obsession. Um, it's very hard for me to do anything else. Um, chances are, if we're talking, I'm framing or shaping or paying attention to the paint around you or what you have on. It's, um, it is my absolute favorite thing. But painting is also something that uh, I didn't see growing up, to be honest. The only paint I saw was spray paint. And spray paint was something that the boys used. Girls couldn't use spray paint. So um, I knew that in order to be respected as a, as a painter where I'm from, as an artist, I didn't hear the term painter, I heard the term artist. I had to get that paint in my hands, you know? And I had to learn quickly how to use it. I had to break some rules to be an artist. I knew that. Um, and so I had to grow comfortable in those areas early. Um, I wanted to paint because I wanted 
to be the best. I want it to be seen, right? Um, and I continue to paint because I want my practice to be respected. Yeah. Lovely. And I know that painting, the act of painting is a devotional act for you as well. So it's so interesting to think of the symbolism of paint itself, um, which I don't think we always really realize how precious of a material it has historically been. And it can be in that way, kind of hard to obtain. And it's, it's really it's beautiful a, it's in that way. A, paint is a, it's an, it's an ancient medium, right? Right? So um, it, it is something that is in my hands when I'm painting. I'm in, it, the paint is in my hands, right? The uh, prayer is in my hands. Paint, prayer, paint, prayer. Paint. It's the medium. It's the, it's the way I stay in touch with my Lord and Savior, truly. Um, and it's also a way I stay in touch with myself, my girl, my Jenny. <laughs> Lovely. And Jennifer? Um, I started, I mean, as a kid, I was always a maker. I was always making things, drawing, crafting, sewing. It was my way, since I was very shy and awkward and I spent a lot of time by myself, it was something that comforted me. It was a place that I could go where I could forget myself and really get inside. And through that and through drawing, I I found this place where it was something that I was very good at. And I, I would, sorry, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> Doing great. Um, through drawing, I, I think the next step was painting. And I remember buying my first set of paints in high school, I was probably 14 or 15, and I bought a small set, I bought a canvas, and I took them to my bedroom, and I set up a little vase and flowers, and I thought, well, I'm really good at drawing, I'm gonna be really good at painting, and it was a mess. <laughs> it was, if you've ever used oils for the first time, they're, they're hard to operate. They're the mixing, they turn into mud, all of the colors together. So, but I felt challenged by that. I wanted to, to push that. And I always knew that I wanted to be an artist. So when I went to college and I really learned how to use paint and I learned how to see and have an eye where color and line and form and perspective um, were all of these tools that I could use to create a painting, to use this material that I was really obsessed with. And at that time in college, um, I went to Boston University and I would go to museums a lot. And that's when I fell in love with standing in front of paintings. And I wanted to not only do what was happening in those paintings, but I wanted to be a painter. I wanted to, it create, it stirred emotion in me and desire that I would take back to the studio, back to school, um, to continue to push myself with that. And I think like the biggest part of painting for me at that time was the desire to just want to do it, that that's what moved me. Um, and I guess so many years later, what really keeps me back to coming back to painting and enjoying painting is I love the medium. I love mixing color. I love the fact that I can match any color, um, that these are tools that I have, like to have that, um, that skill which is important to me. Um, and like everyone was saying, like it, that never gets boring. Um, and it always, at one point where as an art, as a student when you're trying to learn, um, and you get past that point where you, where you are having a career as an artist, um, 
there's so many things that are wrapped up in like a daily life of an artist and painting, just going to the studio, the, um, I don't know. It's always, it's always exciting and the whole process of creating a show, um, creating a painting, coming up with ideas and creating something that's never existed before. Beautiful. I love that kind of description too from the very beginning about the, you know, very kind of materiality of paint and the process of kind of working with that material because I think each of you in your own way make painting seem almost ethereal, but it goes back and forth between that very kind of physical reality of what it was, the labor to go into it and kind of seeing and feeling that texture of the paint, but also, of course, kind of transforms to something that feels so light and weightless and, and really ethereal in that way, which is so beautiful. So I think I'm gonna ask my next question of Genesis. So the book, Great Women Painters, of course, has a strike through for the word woman, and which begs the question kind of of the relationship between gender and the arts. And Genesis, I wondered if you could share some thoughts about your thoughts of considering yourself as an artist in relation to gender. How do I consider myself as an artist in relation to gender? Um, uh, I, my gender's presentation presents differently to um, folk, apparently. Um, I'm laughing, and that was my wife who laughed, because it's, it's just a, it's a very, very interesting experience to be mistaken for something else or for something other. Um, so my gender gives me, it is a gift from God, it truly is, and it is as wide as my wings are, and I don't have to pronounce it one way or another. And so I allow that space of fluidity to exist in everything that I do. And painting is no different. Um, I am a devotional painter, praise God. And um, most of my conversations in prayer uh, have nothing to do with gender. <laughs> um, my relationship with the narratives of those that I paint have nothing to do with gender. Um, so that's, it's such an interesting question um, because it's, truly only something that really matters um, on this plane. Um, but it is a strength. Being a woman is a strength. It is, it is a gift. Um, and then my gender's presentation, right, is a gift. And I get to adorn my gender however the hell I choose to. Um, so that's how, right? One more thing, guys. Um, I think that today, to be a woman who paints is pretty badass, right? <laughs> and so I, this is this is such this is exciting for me because I get to live and celebrate and sit in my gender. I don't have to hide any part of that, right? I can dress it up in a skirt and shoes. It, the point is. Um, that I, 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 it's, it's, it's something that's, that I can use to help lift, um, to help elevate, and to help free, and to help love, which ultimately is what this painting thing and praying thing for me is all about. Lovely, thank you. And Shaba, how about you? How is uh, gender important or not to your work? Um, well, I feel like my work is informed by gender, mainly because most of my subjects are women. And um, I do paint male subjects, but I do see them as being kind of like supplementary to the female subjects in the paintings. So what I mean by that is that um, if the female subject or the women in the work are meant to symbolize something or embody something, cultural or a collective cultural idea, then the male figures present a foil to that or they present a um, extension to that. So a lot of times in my work, I'm dealing with archetypes and their 
embody through figuration. And I feel like, you know, even in real life, that's generally what happens. Like, people, they um, become, for better or worse, they become their identity or their personalities. Some aspects of it are, are inherent, but other aspects are, you know, things that they have become attached to them along the way. Um, oftentimes, certain ideas or tropes that are projected upon them become embedded in them. And that relates somewhat to the materiality of my work or a lot of the formal qualities of painting, them being heavily based in collage and me using a lot of different kinds of materials to compose the figures. So that formal aspect of the work is really meant to um, make literal a conceptual concern. And back to a lot of the formal aspects of the painting, after having like a, um, I'm going to see the, the exhibition at the Nasher today, I was thinking a lot about my own physicality in relation to my work and how that's impacted by my gender, just how I relate to my work. Um, the sewing has been a way for me to reach this monumental scale that I think is often associated with like um, male artists or this kind of machismo is probably a better word with art, but I'm able to kind of reach that scale um, with my own physicality through sewing and through assemblage and through this building that is not as immediate as um, a, you know, <laughs> some of those kinds of, I guess, early modernist works, but I feel like it has the same impact. So I think that, oh, and lastly, just my gender has informed my lived experience, so in that way, um, it's created the lens in which I experience the world, and all of my work is really coming from my own personal perspective. So um, for all those very, you know, sincere reasons, I feel like my gender is a really big, big part of my own gaze, my own worldview. So it touches every aspect of my practice. It's lovely. I love thinking through the idea of sewing as being this really beautiful way to augment and to build with the different parts together that make this really large whole and how that's you know, such a strength in the work. Um, Lisa, who is a woman painter's work that excites you? As I said, I was going to pivot. <laughs> um, I asked that question knowing a pivot was coming. <laughs> well, it's not so much that I don't want to answer that question. It's just that I had an answer I wanted to. I was going to do the Bill Clinton answer the question you wished you'd been asked. <laughs> um, remember him? Um, so long ago. Um, anyway, so the thing I was thinking when I was thinking about the, the whole question about gender, and it's so funny because there was a article, there was a magazine, remember magazines, um, it, called Tema Celeste in 1990, I was asked the question, how does gender enter your work? And I, and I had answered that question and I was sitting here thinking, oh, I should have looked up what I said then, but anyway. Um, Anyway, so, but I'm gonna answer this one that I wasn't answering. So when I was thinking about something that was kind of, you know, wandering around my studio recently, I came across a little slim catalog from a, like a do-it-yourself gallery called Trial Balloon that Nicola Tyson, an artist, painter, Nicola Tyson, she may be in the book, I don't remember if, I haven't looked through the book, um, she shows with Friedrich Petzl. Um, she uh, did a show in 1993 or so, 1992, 1993, in her loft. She started this do-it-yourself gallery. Um, it was called Trial Balloon, and it was just, uh, I'm gonna read just so I get it right. Trial Balloon presented exhibitions in Tyson's studio in Soho. Her project exemplified the do-it-yourself spirit of the communities to organize, organize, collaborate, and support creative work by under her underrecognized peers. Tyson recalls, quote, it was a woman-only space with a special focus on the emerging lesbian subculture at the time. And there were, I remember specifically, um, 
meeting all of these artists. And I remember the times, early 90s, there was no money. The art world had collapsed. The business around the art world had collapsed. Um, mostly it was about artist space um, and uh, white columns and you know, getting Bill Arning to your studio and different things like that. Like we had no support as young artists. So the things like that were really important. And the kind of work I was making at the time, I would hear people whisper, because they didn't know what I looked like, she better be gay. <laughs> anyway, um, because things were like, you know, the sort of politics, sort of quasi politics around art. People were trying to kind of pigeonhole people. But Nicola and her group were much more sophisticated than that and like welcomed me as a non-gay kind of outlier. Um, we hung out, we partied, and there was this amazing show. And I remember Nicole Eisenman had, did wall drawings. And um, there was this amazing wall drawing that Nicole Eisenman did. Um, and um, I even downloaded, you can you could look this up, that I had downloaded the review of it and um, I kind of wanted to get the exact um, description of the review. Just give me one second because it was, it's, it's so hilarious. Um, it's worth hearing this. Um, I had my little research in my room today. Um, and you know, we're talking about 1992, so, oh yeah. Um, and this was like her first emergence. This is, Nicole wasn't painting at the time. She was drawing on the wall, and it got painted over, of this loft. And so it says, this is a review of it. But, but Eisenman also made a series of expansively detailed ink drawings that replay her handling of the figure on a more contained scale. But in the captured, this is the name of the piece that I'm talking about the captured pirates on the Isle of Lesbos, 1992, a gleeful horde of brawny women enact a ritual of mass castration. I gotta tell you, it was so funny, this drawing. <laughs> and everyone like was just drinking beer and enjoying this drawing and it was very, very everything was sort of like very light and, um, and then I also remember going around to galleries and seeing artists like Karen Kalimnik doing, she was like wearing like her earmuffs. She always had like a sense of like everything was too loud. And she was just starting to paint, but she was like throwing sparkles around and um, di different, different people um, just starting out. I remember seeing um, Kiki Smith at MoMA, like her, just this little project room or in like alternative spaces, seeing Ellen Burke and Blitz drawings at white columns and saying, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and, you know, this utter miasma. So it wasn't like feminist art was like not like a thing, and it wasn't like people were trying to make something. It wasn't like a movement. It was just happening, like Sue Williams at 303. And then eventually there was the, what we called the political um, biennial. Uh, which was supposedly a failure, but it was actually one of the greatest biennials that any, in memory, where Sue Williams had the pile of vomit. The, <laughs> and it was like kind of an exciting time. And then ultimately, Carol Walker shows up with that installation at the drawing center, and you were seriously like, game changed. Everybody, you know, stop what you're doing. <laughs> what the hell is this? You know, we gotta rethink everything. So it's like, this is just like from 90 through 94. And you're just walking around, nothing, literally everybody is just scrapping. And these are, it was just like the knowledge was almost 80% of the people who were doing really good art were women. And I was a part of that. And I was, and I was really excited to be a part of that. And I was making no money and really nobody was. We were all doing things like, you know, teaching at whatever place you could teach and, you know, finding ways of keeping your head above water, but then eventually, slowly but slowly, in comes different forces. And um, I have to say, it was really fun and it was a great memory. And um, 
I just wanted to share that with you because in terms of like what my favorite women artists are, it's more like the memory of that kind of time was just something I wanted to share. And that was like the miasma of a time of becoming a woman artist in a time that I felt very privileged. That's wonderful. That's such a wonderful painting the picture of what was truly like an epic generation of women artists um, in their earlier foundation in the 90s. And I don't, and I don't think, sorry, and I don't think it's actually a time that most people recorded or remember because mm -hmm. obviously when there was no money, people didn't have, th these things didn't exist, so there weren't a lot of pictures. Um, but it, like I said, it, 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 it's so visceral. Exactly. And I think that's actually a great segue to our final question before we open it up to the audience. I'm from Jennifer. So looking towards the future, what advice would you give to ex in, sorry, aspiring young women artists? <laughs> well, I would say looking at art in person is um, a really huge part of, especially today we see so much on our phone and on the computer, to really look at art and to go to museums, to go to galleries, to go by yourself and to spend the time, um, to spend 30 minutes in front of a piece or more because if you allow yourself to do that, work will open itself up to you in a way that it can't when you're looking on your phone. And so to slow things down, to take that time, but also you're gonna have to work really hard. And it's not, a lot of times I'm sure everyone, every artist here gets a question, do you only work when you're inspired? It's like, no, we work every day, like it's, it's something that um, you love to do, but you, that's a part of it. It's almost like being an athlete. You practice every day. Um, and you, you can't really be precious with, if you make one little painting and you can feel proud of that, but you really have to make more. Like it, it has to be this process of creating every day whether you're actually making a painting or not, um, that you're in the studio, that that is part of your practice. And through that, other ideas and possibilities will open up to you in ways that you, you have to be doing that through the process. You can't just think your way through things. You actually have to be getting, it, getting in there um, and making. Um, I think, I don't know if there are any aspiring young artists in the audience, but we are going to open it up to your questions. Maybe aspiring old artists. Aspiring old artists. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have about 10 minutes. There are some mics uh, floating around. So just raise your hand if you have a question for our panelists. And if not, we'll just keep talking. Oh, this is so fun. <laughs> um, I think it's so commonplace for women's work and efforts and time to not be taken seriously. And I'm just wondering if there, if there was a turning point, point in your career where you recognized you were being treated with legitimacy in a way that maybe your peers who weren't women are. Like, what was that turning point? Thank you. Anyone want to take that? I'm not sure I understood the question. So I think the question was about maybe a time where your work, you didn't think that your work were ta being taken serious in the same way as a male colleague. Did I get that correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Should I just get, should I just go for it? <laughs> I don't think that was the question. It's more so a question about um, when you noticed it was being treated with legitimacy rather than when it wasn't. May I jump in? Um, once I 
painted something that I couldn't stop looking at, that I couldn't stop thinking about, that I couldn't, like I just couldn't get it out of my head. It was like the most, it was the coolest thing I'd done. Um, I didn't wait for it to be legit for anybody else. I expect for it to be seen, right? And so as a woman, right, we spoke about gender. Often my gender suggests that I should wait. I won't wait. Um, I decided a long time ago, right? In that sense, in that space of reflection, someone is going to feel this as deeply as I do. Um, so I didn't wait for that. Don't wait for that. Do you want two answers to that question? I, I mean, I was, in, I was in undergraduate school, and I just, like, at a certain point, just all of a sudden became, hands down, out of the box, the best painter in school. And it was like the faculty just, like, were just so incredibly, you know, happy to give me anything I needed to accomplish what I needed to accomplish. I got into graduate Yale and nobody else had gotten into Yale for, you know, whatever, 20 years from, or ever from the school. And, you know, the, the guys were extremely unhappy. And I just, you know, was getting a, an incredible amount of attention from the faculty. And there was like, some graffiti in my studio, there were paintings that got damaged, there was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, um, yeah, people put holes through my paintings, there were, th you know, there, were, there was backlash, but I was like, fuck you, suckers. <laughs> I'm out of here, motherfuckers, I'm out of here. See you on the other side of whatever. And, and actually, one of these people who I believe did this actually came into a show, and I was behind the desk, and he was like signing the book, and he was kind of like looking at the show, and I would just sort of like hit out, and I was just like, whatever. But it's just like, you know, that is, that was the starting point of recognizing, you know, it's probably hard to be left behind, and you know, it's just, you just have to get used to it if you're going to be given a gift from God, as she said, because what we are up here is gifted. And we have to appreciate that. And sometimes that's hard for people to accept. But it's, you know, t tough shit. Fixed the painting too. <laughs> I, I, and my well, dentist. Bought all it. of my mom was there telling me to stand up up here, but I feel y'all can hear me. Do I need to stand up? Hold my stuff. I get from all of you that you are extremely confident in your creative process. I would like to know. Do you ever create with the viewer in mind, or do you always create with whatever it is you like in mind? That's a good question, yeah. That's a good question. Thank you for standing and asking that. That's a really good question. Who wants to take that on? I would say, I mean, for me personally, I do think about the viewer. Um, my work is more abstract, and when you're standing in front of it, there's kind of an optical illusion or a vibrational um, pulse that you can feel. So, and I do think about how color affects a viewer, um, whether that's gonna give someone joy or give them a sense of calm, so, and also in terms of size, like how, how is your body going to relate to smaller painting compared to a larger one? If something is larger and you're standing in front of it, like how is that gonna make you feel? So, I mean, that's something that I do, I do th generally think about. Um, 
I would say that I think about a viewer experience when making a work, um, especially when making a show, because I feel like all the different works together come together to create an additional work. So it's kind of the difference between like going to see an exhibition as opposed to seeing like one discrete work. But I try not to think too deeply about a viewer's opinion about a piece, because I feel like once you go down that path, it can get slightly distracting when you're in the studio. So it's important to think about what kind of experience you want to, I guess, ultimately curate for a viewer, but to not anticipate their reactions or their um, opinions about the work. Um, I was raised by a, a group of people who I call uh, Black Woman University. Um, my mother is one of the smartest women I know. My grandmother is the strongest woman I know. My aunts are the best gossipers and uh, marketing consultants that you could ever come across. Um, and my cousins were great teachers. And so I actually do paint with those viewers in mind. Um, it is important to me that the work stands out for them. It means the world to me when my mom stops and says, good job, Jenny. Um, and that is not often. Um, <laughs> They are very, very critical black women. They are very uh, brilliant black women. I am partnered with a brilliant black woman. Um, she comes into my studio and she will often give me a seven out of 10. <laughs> and that's important, that's important, right? Because uh, I never wanna be too big for that. Um, another viewer that I do paint with in mind are children. When you can get a child to do this with their cell phone, <laughs> then I've done my job as a saint. I mean, I think you have to think about a viewer because this is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. And we are not doing something just for ourselves. It is, but I think that the um, underbelly of the question is, are you doing it for the collector or the, are you trying to sell it to something? I, we cannot think about that stuff. That stuff is very, very damaging. You, know, you can't think about like, you know, who's gonna like it? Are they gonna like, you know, cause that will always mess you up. That'll trip you up. Um, can't think about the win. You have to think about, you know, um, your, you know, I, I'm very lucky to be married to the same, to the, someone that, I met in graduate school. We've been looking at each other's work since 1985, and we always tell each other the truth. Sometimes we fight about it, and only recently we have separate bedrooms that sometimes, you know, we have to... <laughs> no, it never gets that bad, but like... <laughs> but there is that option. Um, but, it, 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 but it's like we send pictures of each other's work to each other, he just sent something to me today, like, did I mess this up? And I'm like, come on, I'm, you know, I'm in Texas, give me a break. But it's like, he sent me something that he was working on. And, you know, just say like, and he gets really mad at me if I critique him, <laughs> like, just even through, and it's like, you're supposed to, I'll say, I gotta see it in person, don't say, I don't wanna just judge it, because I know I'm gonna get in trouble if I say something, you know, a little off about a painting. But the, you have to have great people that you trust to tell you the truth about your work or your audience, and I think that's why you say your your wonderful family that you trust to say this is, you know, you know whatever. But like I do think that you can have um, a certain group of people that you sort of has a, a, as an imaginary audience also that are highly intelligent, visually intelligent people, and you can't worry about people who are not, you know not ever going to get you. Never, that's just not the audience that you're gonna worry about. Um, and, you know, um, over the years, you know, I have had people who have told me, I've never understood your work, and then all of a sudden, one day, I completely fell in love with it. It's like kind of like getting addicted to, you know, one day you hate coffee, and then all of a sudden you become addicted to it. And something turned, something changed for me. And that's really gratifying. 
Well, I think we're at time, so please join me in giving a huge round of applause to these great women painters. Yeah.